librarians here. Welcome to the Cary Library for this incredibly special event. I know you don't want to hear from me, but I'm going to talk for like two minutes. Um, just to say that bathrooms are back there. Um, the book sale is ongoing with Powerhouse, Christine's amazing book about teen romance. Uh, very <laughs> Anyways, uh, the proceeds of the sales of the book go to the Friends of the Cary Library, so that's really important. Um, the books are brought to us by Porter Square Books, so if you want to know anybody who did not make it today, uh, Christine is going to be at Porter Square Books tonight at 7, but I'm glad you're here and not there. I <laughs> um, want to thank the Foundation because they bring us almost all of our programs. And um, if you need a, an assistive listening device, just let me know. Uh, I'm going to introduce Christine. Can you all hear me? Well, I'm going to introduce Christine. I'm supposed to read her bio. But <laughs> if you're OK with telling your own bio, I have a couple of short, short stories to say. Because when I first booked Christine to come here, I reached out to every coach in the town, the LUS, the Lexington United, and the excitement <laughs> was just unbelievable. It was so exciting for me to see that you were here for this amazing program. To, yesterday, we got a Facebook message from somebody saying, am I allowed to come? I'm a, you know, an adult by myself. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, because Christine is my childhood idol. Aww. Yeah. So, so I'm a little bit like Brickland <laughs> <laughs> about how awesome this is. And again, I'm just going to give it to Christine. You can tell them all about yourself. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Well, it's great to be, thank you, I'm sorry I'm a little late, I hit a, a little bit of traffic, so I apologize, because um, I'm never late for a game, so I'm like, this is the next best thing I have, is my speaking engagements. Um, but it's great to be here, and um, I'm excited to talk about the book, but to be around people, obviously, that are interested in the game of soccer, um, and being better players and better people. And um, I know that something wonderful happened this past summer, in the U.S. once again, oh, world champions. <laughs> uh, I was fortunate enough to be over there. I was over there for the opening game when France played Korea. Um, and I have to say, it was only my second World Cup game that I've ever watched. <laughs> and I also have to say, it's more fun playing. <laughs> so I'd rather be on the field, but it was my only second world, so it was so cool uh, to be there. And obviously, Seeing France open up the World Cup with the host country and the, the pack crowd and just the, the support uh, that the French people gave to their, their team was incredible. And then I was able to go back again for the semis and finals. I was keeping my fingers crossed all summer because I told my kids, I was like, we're going back to the semis and finals no matter what. <laughs> so the kids were like, oh, come on, US, come on. So uh, my two girls are 11 and 8, so they were super excited to be there and, uh, and witness that. And I think what was was really cool about this World Cup. It's, it was the biggest World Cup for women's soccer. More teams than we've ever had. So that shows that the sport's growing. Uh, FIFA is starting to back the women's game more, finally. I don't know what took so long. Um, but they're really trying to support the women's game more, not just in all the countries that are winning the World Cup, but the countries that uh, first timers. So Thailand, first time in the Women's World Cup. You know, they obviously the US um, scored a lot of goals against them. But that also shows FIFA, you need to start supporting these countries because they need backing, they need finances to get good coaching and teaching these players how to play. So when they're in a big event like the World Cup, they're competing and not being like, yay, I'm here. Um, so that was great. So it was just so fun. And then the U.S., I mean, they were just good. They were really good. And, and just from the depth that they had, the fitness level, the power, the strength, all the different uh, things that they could bring to the table were pretty incredible. But I'd say the France and England game were probably the two highlights of the summer uh, that the US, you know, those games. And obviously the, uh, the finals against Holland. Um, they're the, Holland, the Dutch coach I played soccer with at college, Serena. So I was super excited. I got to go down on the field. So this was another surprise. So I'm there for the World Cup. I was there with FIFA. And at halftime of the final, they're like, they call me over, one of the people that work there, like, we would like you to go down to the field. I was like, sure, this is great. <laughs> I'd love to. And so I got to go down there, and then I still didn't really know what I was going to be a part of. And then I started following all the 
the important people got out to the stage, and then I got to be on on the podium, and I got firsthand to hug all the sweaty players and <laughs> congratulate them. But then I also got to. Uh, give my friend a hug from Holland and I was really, I haven't seen her since college and what she's done with the Dutch team has been pretty incredible and I was just so proud of, of what her team did and what she did with her team during this World Cup and be able to give her a big hug. So that was super exciting, the World Cup for me and obviously worked a lot of camps throughout the time. But prior to that, my, my book came out, Powerhouse, and um, there are a couple of different reasons why I decided to write a book with um, John and Lynette. When I'm uh, about, what is it, five years ago, I moved to Austin, Texas. I was living in Needham, and I, I, was mo I moved to Austin, Texas to be the, one of the assistant coaches at the University of Texas. The head coach is a good friend from college, and she's like, why don't you come coach? You've always wanted to try, and I'm like, yeah, I have. And we were a little bit tired of the winners, so we're like, sweet, let's go. <laughs> so I, I coached there for three years. While I was there, I met Donna Lynette. Their daughter, they have twin girls, and one of the twins became good friends with my daughter. They were in kindergarten together, and they're immediate friends. So we, we got to know them real well, and through the time, we were there for three years, and then we ended up moving back to Boston, be closer to family. My husband's a firefighter, so we went back to him, uh, his firefighting gig. And, um, but they came to visit, and we were sitting around my table in the kitchen, and John, he's in the business world. Lynette is also an academic. She's a, well, now she's the CFO of her university in, in Austin. And we were talking about the US team and I would share stories, but they followed them, so they kind of knew. And they're like, you guys, that, there's so much that your team provided, not just the, the competitiveness on the field, but just how you did it. You know, it's not just people that can relate to in sports, but people could also relate in business and organizations, any type that's running a group or a team to try to be better. He goes, this would be a great platform for you. And I'm like, hey, maybe it would be. <laughs> And I didn't really, you know, when you kind of think of it, you're like, you talk and you talk. And then soon after, John's like, let's put this together. So we started to work out an outline and game plan. And he's in the business world. And he says the biggest challenge for organizations is working together. Because in the business world, we're always looking to get, you know, the next level, up the ladder. In the, in the sports world, in a sense, but you need a team to be able to do that. So this, he's like, this would be great. And so we created Powerhouse. And when they, the, I learned a lot about writing and edit, uh, editors and the publishing company, all that stuff. And they were pick, trying to pick the, the name of the book and they first came out Powerhouse. And I was like, gosh, that kind of gives like a, feel, a negative connotation with me. But then the definition was just a, a group comes together that has energy and wants to succeed. And I was like, oh my God, that's what our team was. You know, we wanted to, so it became that. So we became Powerhouse and obviously 13, um, plays off my number, for those of you that don't know. Do you guys know I was 13? No. Who wears 13 now? Alex Morgan. <laughs> Alex Morgan. Um, so we kind of that, and then the book entails it. it sh what I love about the book, um, I, all my teammates are in it. Uh, Mia did the, the forward for me, and then each chapter, at the end of each chapter, there's an interview with one of my former teammates. And when John and I were working on the book, He's like, um, we need these interviews because we had to interview my teammates. And that was like the hardest thing because I know how busy they are and then we were looking for 45 to an hour of their, their time, which is a lot. So I was like, okay, John, okay, okay, I'll get on it. And I was really kind of pushing that off. I'm like, I don't want to do this. And finally I sent out like a couple texts and then my phone started uh, beeping right away and I was like, oh my gosh. They immediately were like, anytime, let me know. And then that really reiterated what the US team's about and what working together and, and caring about people um, does for you. Because it's not just the field, we, we now support each other in different endeavors that we're involved in. And they immediately uh, set up interviews and the interviews were incredible. We were just going down memory lane. And what was more even convincing that our story is, is pretty good is everyone's stories, they weren't just random. It wasn't like um, Michelle Akers was saying this and then Carla would say this. They all tied in. They all were, you know, respect and trust in each other came up all the time in this. The fun we had with the, uh, training and supporting each other, pushing each other to be better, the leadership that Carla had. All these stories were coming out from different players, but all the same themes. And I was like, you know what, we're onto something here. So we put this book together and it has four components. Obviously that we're taking the work team. We have transform, empower, achieve, and motivate. So that's how we broke the book down. 
and each part has a different um, uh, aspect to it, whether it's leadership, uh, chemistry. I'm not going to go through the whole book because you guys will read it, right? Um, but uh, it's just trying to bring people together. And I think what I loved uh, about playing for the U.S. team was that I had my team. I had the players through the highs, through the lows. And I think if we look at our life and everything we do, we need people. I mean, there's, if you heard any athlete or anyone make a speech about something, there's not like, oh yeah, I did everything myself. <laughs> no one helped me. It's always like, I want to thank this person, this person, this person. So we kind of, you know, you need a group around you to help you be successful or to help you achieve the things you would like to. And, and that team, the, it really plays off the 1999 World Cup team, but from the first World Cup in 1991 and, until the end uh, to this World Cup in 2019, they did things that not all teams can do, except maybe the Patriots. <laughs> uh, but there's reason, there's reason why the Patriots are successful uh, year after year. There was a, there's a reason why the U.S. team is successful. A lot of the stuff is in the book, and it, it's coming together, and it's putting your individual self aside a lot. So, yeah, we all want that, you know, you want to score that goal and then talk to the press after, but it's really some of the players that are running up and down the field doing that work that you don't necessarily see or get recognized for that you, you appreciate. So it talks about like the, all the little things and one of the things I love to share and when I go around speaking is that everything matters. Everything you do matters. It makes an impact. It could be, you could walk into, <coughs> And into school, be like, oh, it's Monday. And how you walk in affects someone around you. I had this when the Boston Breakers were here in the Pro League. There was this player that played with us, Kristen Slater. She was one of our backup goalkeepers. She never stepped on the field. She was a backup. She would walk into the locker room every day. And it, it was early in the morning. I wasn't a morning person, so I was sitting on the training table and just kind of like this, <laughs> like I was just talking about. And she would walk in, and she's like, hey, Lil. How are you? Like big smile, and then she's like, "Hey, pal," you know, and she'd be like, "Smiles for free," and I'm like, "What is wrong with her?" <laughs> I'm saying, "What's wrong with her?" Because I'm all grumpy and tired. But every day she walked in with that same attitude, and then every day I was like, "Worse later." I want worse later. You know, so I love sharing that story because it, it. She never got on the field. She practiced. She she made her a starting goalkeeper better. She made us all better by the positive attitude she held. And that's, that's what I mean with everything matters. No matter what you do on the field matters. And if you look at the, how old are you guys? Oh, what year were you born? 2008, that's awesome. <laughs> Anyone born in 1999? Earlier than that? Anyone born, born in 1980? <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to talk about the 1999 World Cup. Do you guys remember the 1999 World Cup? No. You don't know anything about it. Okay. I played it, just so you know. Uh, but there was a part in the game. So, we hosted it in the U.S. So, just a quick summary. We hosted it in the U.S. And um, we were going to, the host did put it in small stadiums. Because they didn't know who, if we'd get people to come. And they're like, our uh, the World Cup committee is like, well, let's go bigger. Let's go to the football stadiums. So we're like, okay, so for 14 months, our team, along with training on the field to get the stuff done, promoted the World Cup. And we were playing our first game at the Meadowlands. We played a game here at the old Foxborough. We went to Chicago, Soldier Field. Uh, we went to DC and played in one of those stadiums down there. I can't keep track of which one. Out at Stanford and the final was in the Rose Bowl. And our job was to promote it. So this would be like, so you guys play soccer or on a team something? So pretend you're like at practice one afternoon, just playing, and then suddenly Mia and I walk up to your practice. Mia Ham, just in case you don't know who she is. <laughs> and we walk up and we're like, hey guys, would you be pretty psyched? Or, okay, hold on, let's practice. Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino walked up to practice. Okay, so, okay. So you would be so excited, right? Okay, so we did that back in the day for young players like you. So we would have, they called them sneak attacks. And we would sneak up to practice, and then we're like, hey guys, and they're like, oh my gosh. And we would just say hi, sign autographs, but that's how we were promoting the game, the promo of the World Cup. So we did all this promotion, and come, let's fast forward to July, or this is the end of June, our first game at Giant Stadium um, in New Jersey. Anyone from New Jersey area or New York? 
Connecticut, okay. Um, I grew up there and there's always tra traffic on the turnpike. So we're <laughs> headed to the, uh, to the Meadowlands, which is off the New Jersey turnpike. And there's so much traffic and we're like, gosh, and I was like, well, it's always traffic. And then we get off the exit for the Meadowlands and there's still traffic. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is for our game. And as we get off the exit, we start to see people tailgating. Young girls like you have number nine made a ham on the back. Um, and we're like, holy cow, this crowd. And then our PR guy gets on the little mic on the bus and he's like, ladies, we're sold out. And then we just all go nuts on the bus. We just roar. So 85,000 people are coming to watch us play. Right? And that's because we did these little sneak attacks. And we would just talked about the World Cup. We'd sit on airplanes and they're like, oh, who do you play for? We're like, the U.S. They're like, the U.S.? I'm like, yeah, our country. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we would educate people about the game. And then we have this opening game at uh, the Meadowlands. And the funny thing is we're getting ready to come out to, to uh, I don't know if it was to warm up or the start of it. And we all had like tears in our eyes because we're like, wow, like, you know, women's soccer has come far. And our coach Tony, late coach Tony Chico, he was like, oh, good gosh, I didn't know if you guys were going to be able to play because you guys were crying. <laughs> so he was like, so that happened. And then fast forward, we do well. We win, you know, we get out of group play. We go to the quarterfinals in D.C. and play Germany. And uh, the president's there, President Clinton is there. And then we're, uh, we scored our own goal on ourselves. Oh, bummer. Um, and then we're down two to one and a half, and then we come back, we tie, and then we win. And after that game, I was like, we might be winning this whole thing. And then we go to the semifinals at, at uh, Stanford University and play Brazil. And I remember that game was just so hot. We won two nothing, but it was just one of those games that you're like, when is this going to be over? Um, and they were so good, but we were able to sneak two goals in. And then we come to the final at the Rose Bowl against China, one of our biggest rivals back in the day. And this is playing at the Rose Bowl. Biggest football stadium for all the colleges, prestigious. They have the Rose Bowl parade and all that. And 90,000 people are coming to watch us. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. And then 40 million were watching on TV. And do you guys know who J Lo is? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, before she was J Lo, she was just called Jennifer Lopez. And she was playing before our game. Nice. So that's cool, right? Yeah, I thought so too. Um, <laughs> So all these wonderful things were happening and we get to the final and we're just grateful that we're in the final because we were trying to sell the game and make people come and, and we get to the final and now we're like, okay, shoot, now we gotta win. <laughs> you know, we've done this work and we got to this opportunity. So we go, the final happens, 90,000 people, it's like 100 degrees, it's so hot and uh, the game is, you know, back and forth, tied up, overtime and we're going to overtime. And I talk about everything matters. And this is where I'm gonna share a little bit of the story. We're in overtime, Michelle Akers goes out. Michelle Akers is 5'10", and she's about six feet with her hair, because she had big, we used to call her Mufasa from The Lion King. <laughs> big mane, lion hair. And she's our best player, dominant. So she goes out because on a corner kick, Brianna Scurry, our goalie, was trying to clear the ball, punched the ball, but also punched her. Plus she was, gave everything she possibly could and she didn't have anything left in her engine. So she goes out, and this is overtime, and China suddenly goes, yes. Because they know that our best player is out, the heart of our midfield is out. So they just are coming at us, and we're holding strong, but they get like corner kick after corner kick, and finally that one corner kick they get, um, and Michelle's usually right in the center of our, our, def our box right there to clear everything out. So a corner kicks, that this is the goal, I'm normally always on this post, okay? So the corner kick was coming from over there. If the corner kick came from that side, I would still be here. Now the older people in the room, <laughs> am I lefty or righty? Okay, as a football player, soccer player. Anyone, who said it? Lefty, lefty yes. Thank you for knowing that. <laughs> so I'm a lefty, so the reason why I'm on this post is so if the ball comes in here, I can clean it out with my, I can clear it out with my left foot. Now, if I'm on this side, I clear it out with my right, which my right foot's pretty good too, I'm not gonna slack that up, but it, I'm stronger over here. So I've been on this post. I played 354 times for my country. Most of anyone in the entire world. That's a lot. And I'm super tired. <laughs> so, so 
still, I'm on this post and I think out of 354 games, I would say about 340 something I've been in the same position. Never glamorous. It's great because there's always water here when you get thirsty. So I remember right at this play, the, it was hot out. I got some water. I scored it. It scored in my head. And then it happens. They serve a ball. Comes across. Unperfect ball. And right where Michelle Akers should be. So whoever was there, I'm not sure who it was, jumped but missed the ball. And then the Chinese person heads the ball. Coming right at me. So as the ball moves this way, because we're, uh, if we, We've done this so many times in practice and preparation before. I'm on my post. I shift to make the goal smaller. Okay? So I'm here. And our goalkeeper shifts to make cut off the angle. So as she heads the ball, it goes past our keeper. And it's coming right for me. Oh. Suspense is killing you, right? You know what happens. Ball comes. Weakest part of my game. What do you think the weakest part of my game? If I'm 5'4", what do you think the weakest part of my game is? Jumping. Well, yeah, that's yeah, that could be hard. But what do you what do you think? I'm I'm really good at dribbling, passing, shooting. What do you think the weakest is? Heading. Yes, heading is the weakest part of my game. Ball comes to me, comes this way. All I do, I jump. Probably like a little credit card jump. I head the ball. Yes, I save the game right there. So, but and I head it, and it lands in the six yard box. And there's three Chinese players right there. And I'm thinking, someone kick it. <laughs> and then Brandy does a kick, and I think it might have been a little bit of a high kick, but we didn't call it. Um, and the ball clears. And then we all leave you know, our spots, and Julie Fowdy and I get right next to each other. We just look at each other, and we kind of start laughing, and like, did that really just happen? And then needless to say, we go over times over, we go to penalty kicks, we end up winning on penalty kicks. Um, but everything matters. 354 games I've played. Majority of my time I've been on this post. I know the routine. I could be like, oh, I'm on the post again and not really pay any attention. The ball goes, I'm like, I'm standing here. And I don't do my job, but I do it because I know it matters. And I come, and do you know how wide my forehead is? <laughs> Get to guess. Yeah. Close, three and a half. Three and a half inches, three and a half inches. So when I, we talk about every little thing that you do, it matters. You know, my shifting matters. Running up and down the field, making a side tackle. Being on the sideline, cheering, up your, cheering on your teammate. Moms and dads just giving your kids hugs. All that stuff matters. And if we don't pay attention to it and we don't focus on the little things and do our job, then we're not going to help our team succeed. So that 1999 team, there were so many moments just like my header. That wasn't the only thing that helped us be successful. Um, there are all these little things leading up to that. And then you come to the penalty kicks, and I'm just going to share one story about the penalty kicks and open up for some questions. So, you guys know what happens when you go to PKs at the end of the game. You have five kicks. Each team, right? Yeah. And the order for our, our kickers, Carla Overbeck, our captain, our center defender, Joy Fawcett, our other, uh, other leader, she plays right defender. Third, yours truly. Fourth, who's fourth? Me and Ham. Me and Ham, good job. And then fifth, the one that took her shirt off. Yeah, <laughs> Brandy. So that was our order. So I'm third, and Carla goes first. And when Carla, when Carla's our captain, and she sets the tone in every aspect. So when she goes up to take the penalty kick and she scores, and she jumps in the air and does a fist pump, I'm like, yeah, we're winning this thing. <laughs> But Carla, so this is still the goal, mind you, and Carla's taking a kick, and she's taking it with her right foot. She kicks it to the goalie's left, and the goalie dives right, okay? Joy comes up. Joy's righty as well. She sets up. She kicks. She kicks to the goalie's left. The goalie dives right. Okay. Who's third? You. Okay. So I'm watching this, and I'm very excited every time it goes, but you're still, I'm kind of in my zone because I know I have to do a job. And each time it's happening, I'm thinking in my head, okay, I'm lefty, I'm not going that way. I'm going this way. Because in your mind, you already have picked your side. So as I'm walking from the mid stripe to the penalty marker, which is really long, by the way, <laughs> when 90,000 people are watching you, um, I'm thinking in my head, do I switch? I mean, she's diving that way, she's been pretty consistent, do I switch, do I go that way? I have kicked the ball that way before. However, it's not, my go-to. So I say, no, stick with what you do and go with it. I'm like, 
like, okay. And there's 90,000 people out there screaming. When I walked from the mid stripe to that penalty marker, I didn't hear anything. So when you, when you hear about athletes or people in the zone, nothing, nothing's in my head. Because easily what could have been in my head, oh my God, can I score? She's going that way and negative all these thoughts. Blah, blah. Nothing was. I'm like, once I decided that I'm going this way, I'm going that way. So I walk up to the penalty marker, I put the ball down, and I talk to my dad after the game. I go, Dad, did you see my penalty kick? He's like, no. I was like, what do you mean, no? <laughs> he goes, I was too nervous. I was like, okay. But then my brother's like, he said it was the quickest. He goes, you put the ball down, then you kicked it. And I felt it, it felt like forever. You know, when I put that ball down, I was like, oh. <laughs> Needless to say, I kick it, what happens? I score, yes, I score. So, and goalie still goes this way. I have to be honest, I'm aiming to go to the low corner. It ended up going upper 90, yes. <laughs> so, note for you guys, aim low because you can always go high. If you aim high, you're going to go off the ball, so don't do that. So, I score. And I talk about this moment too because it's an isolated moment in a team sport. The five of us are taking individual shots. But when I walked from that mid strike to that penalty marker, I never felt I was alone. I never felt like, I felt whatever, whatever happens on this end, that same group is gonna be there with me. And I, that's the power of the team and the power of that team. The support you felt no matter what the circumstances. And I think that's which, what I love about team sports and what I love about coming together and working together because we all have different roles and they are different and some of us have strengths that can do certain things and some of us have other strengths. But when you combine that all together where you're so strong united, it's a really overwhelming feeling. And to play for the U.S. team, not only that 99 team, I, throughout the years you felt that. And that's something that's pretty unbelievable for a period from 1991 to 2019, I mean, we've won, we won four World Cups. That's the most at any country on the women's side. But all the other times we competed in a World Cup, the lowest we ever, the lowest we ever came, third place. So at eight World Cups, we were always in the top three uh, every and everything we did. And that's due to what happens within that team. When you step on the team for the US, you got a mentality that you have to bring you have to compete because if you want to play and stay at that, you have to be able to compete. So if we're, what's your name? Caroline, we're on the U.S. team together. Wouldn't that be cool? You're Carly Lloyd. I'm Alex Morgan. Okay, so we're competing, but we're constantly competing at each other. But I'm also trying to make her better. So we're coming together. So that, that little tangible is so incredible because you're 23, well, I think, I don't know how many on the roster. 23 were on our roster, I think maybe 24, 25 now. And you're competing for one of those spots out of the whole country and bringing a team together. And to be able to do that and compete and push each other and then come together to, for success is really powerful. And really fortunate that I was a part uh, of a group of women that could do that and also now be able to share it through this book. And I think there are so many little tidbits, you guys can read the great quotes in there from um, teammates that can resonate in little things that you're a part of, whether it's on the sports field, whether it's in the classroom, maybe within your family. Um, there are different things that can really help to uh, bring you guys together and be more successful. So I, I hope you young generation look up 1999 World Cup. <laughs> it was pretty cool. And uh, you can actually see it. I mean, it might be a little blurry, but uh, <laughs> there is some footage of it. But also, if you, if you watched the World Cup this summer and you saw that 2019 team play, that was similar to what, what we had going on in 99. And uh, a, a group of women coming together to accomplish a goal to be the best in the world is pretty powerful. So I'm going to open up for some questions because I know there's probably other things and I know people want some, you guys want some autographs or some book sign, whatever maybe. But does anyone have any questions? Um, can I just say one thing really yeah. quick? Is um, two of us are going to be having mics. So if you have a question, you raise your hand and we have a question, one of us will come around with a mic for you so that everybody can hear your question. State your name. Cecilia. How old were you when you started on the World Cup team? Good question. Um, when I made the U.S. team, I was 16 years old. Wow. How old are you guys down here? <laughs> How old are you? You're 14? 16, I was a junior in high school. And I'll tell you a cute little story about this. So 
the national team, 1987 is when I made the team, and the national team started compete our organization in 1985. So it was two years old. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't even know who the coach was. So I was, uh, back in the day, we didn't have the club system that goes on like you guys have now. And I made my state team, so I played for Connecticut and then played for my region team. And then the best region players come together. So north, south, east, west. In that camp we came together, I was there, Mia Hamm was there, Julie Fatty was there, and Joy Fawcett was there. All the players that were on the 99 team. And we were competing to make the under 19 team. But at that time it wasn't a full team, it was just paper. Like if you made it, you're like, oh, congratulations. There's your name on this paper. <laughs> but from that, it's funny, right? <laughs> from that, I, Anson Dorrance, who was the coach of the women's team, asked me, Mia, Julie, and Joy to join the full team. So I'm in this room. I'm 16, mind you, and very homesick when I travel. He's like, so I would like you guys to come with us on a trip in like three weeks to China. <laughs> That's what I did. I was like, what? Um, I'm like, can I ask my mom and dad if I can go home? <laughs> and I really did. So I call home and my parents, we, they grew up in New York City, not soccer people. I'm like, mom and dad, I got a chance to, I'm, I'm like, I made this 19 team, but then I got asked to go join the US team and they're going on a trip to China. And my parents were like, okay. And in the back of my head, I'm like, you're just gonna let me go with all these strangers <laughs> all the way around the world? Uh, but they, they let me and thank God they did. And that was the start of my career. I think there's... How many Olympics do you have on your head? <laughs> Well, I'm hoping when I headed the ball, they cleared the ball up. Because when I was, in 1999, I didn't have as many. My kids give me those wrinkles. Are uh, you were part of the Boston Breakers, mm -hmm. and I was wondering what you do or other people could do to bring it back to the soccer Yeah. Yeah. Right now. That's Woo -hoo! It's, if we had that, mer uh, that magic potion to figure out what's going to help people come and support the, not only women's soccer, but you know, women's sports in general, it, it would be great. And I think, um, you know, obviously the organization, I, I was blessed to play for the Breakers and be a part of it. And I think through the years, the organization just got a little sidetracked on where we're going. And obviously some of the investors, a lot more money was spent than they were planning. So we lost it. But that was due with many different factors. But in the end, the way you help women's soccer, women's sports, is to buy a ticket. Buy a ticket. Go take your family and watch the game because every ticket, the more tickets being sold shows that there's a need and a want. And then the sponsors realize that and then they come on board. Uh, it's not an easy thing, um, but then continue to, continue to support in any way you can. That's really what, what can help. Right here, yeah. What year was your last um, uh, game? Last game, I can remember it. 2010, I retired. Um, actually, it wasn't my last game. It was my last goal that I scored in my last game. Um, it was, I don't want to say it was here, but it wasn't here. Mexico, yes, in Mexico it was. Uh, but the, the, but the, my last goal was in a game against Germany that I scored. But then... October of 2010 or September, we had qualifications for the 2011 World Cup, and I was back on the team. I I, uh, I gave birth to my first daughter in 2008, and my husband Earl and he's like, "Are you still playing?" And I was like, "I think so. <laughs> I think I can still do it." So I came back to play. I played in the Pro League in Boston for the WPS, and then I got back invited to the, with the U.S. team. And the qualifications for the 2011 World Cup was in Mexico. And my last game I ever played for the U.S., I lost to Mexico. And I played the last 15 minutes, and that was my last game I ever played for the U.S. But I had a lot of other great games, let me tell you. Um, when did you start to like soccer? When did I start to like soccer? I liked soccer probably when I was about six. Do you know, you want to know why I like soccer? Yeah? Because they had oranges at halftime. <laughs> So I swear, I used to see how many I could eat at halftime. I mean, and even now that the kids I'm coaching and in our town, they still do halftime snacks. And I'm so excited. Some of the snacks, I'm like, okay, I don't think we need that. But, 
but the oranges, I loved it. I wanted to see how much I could eat and, and have it. So don't ever lose that. That's the, that's the fun. And I, and I had fun when I played. I loved it. Loved being around, loved chasing the ball around. And, uh, but the oranges were really why I played soccer. <laughs> there's a couple, yeah, there's one here. How long have you been playing soccer? How long? Okay, so let's see if you guys, good math. I made the national team at 16. I retired at 39. 23 years. I played for the U.S. However, at 16, let's go back to, how old was I when I started playing soccer? Six. So I had another 10 years to that. So 33 years I played soccer. And now, not so, not so much playing anymore. <laughs> Here and there, maybe. Yeah. If you could pick a position to play besides your World Cup position, what position would you play? Ooh. Not goalie. Um, I think, I don't know if I, I would switch. We, so in the World Cup, majority, our system in the 99 World Cup, we played a 4-3-3. So I was one of those attacking midfielders and that's like heaven. Love it. Uh, we did some, back in the early years, we did play a 3-4-3 and I was outside left midfield. Didn't love it, but I loved it in the same sense because it was a lot of work. You're doing a lot of running up and down the field. Um, so I don't think I would switch. I think attacking midfielder would be probably the same thing I'd, I'd like to play. There's one behind in the door over here. How old were you when you played for your first club team? Oh, I, you know, they were just starting club soccer. And I think, I, I think it was, I kind of want to say it was around 16 when I made the national team. We didn't have club soccer like we do now with all this soccer. I played for my town, so I grew up in a town called Wilton, Wilton in Connecticut. And I played for my town team. And I played from second grade to eighth grade, I played with boys. Because there wasn't a girls team. So it's a lot different, right? You got all your buddies you're playing with, right? Yeah? Playing lots of games, yeah. So it was different. Um, but now, obviously, the club system is an avenue that a lot of people go through. We got one here. Uh, your inspirations could be either men's or women's. And if you could, your top three list on the women's ever. Of players? Including the new generation. Yes. The top so three. So inspirations and your top three. My inspirations. Okay, my first inspiration is my older brother. My brother Scott, he's four years older than I am. And he likes to say that he taught me everything. <laughs> and I'll have to give him a lot of credit for, for a lot of things. And the one thing that my brother did for me, besides beat me up and make me tough, is he let me play. So he's four years older, and I was a tomboy. I, all, all I wanted to do was play sports. And he would come, the buddies would come over, they'd play football in the yard, or they'd play, you know, wiffle ball or anything, and I'd always be like, can I go? <laughs> and uh, he let me. But he had one rule. He said, you can't cry. And do you know how many times I wanted to cry? A lot because I would lose or I'd get the ball taken or you know someone would tackle me or something but I held strong because he's like if I cry I'm not invited back <laughs> so he, he was I would say my biggest inspiration and then from there when I joined the US team the players I was inspired by these women because I wasn't seeing a lot of women out there so then when I was a part of a, a team like the US team with all these women that wanted to compete wanted to work hard sweat and laugh and, and fight in there I was like gosh these guys these girls are incredible so they, they really were, were my inspiration for my career. And I would say the top players in the world you're talking? Ever. Ever. Well, Michelle Akers is definitely, I think, the best player in the world. You got Marta, who tears up everywhere. You're Brazilian. You're waiting for me to say Marta. For more than that, but it's not. But I mean, Mia's pretty unbelievable. You know, the, those players, and I mean, I try to think of the players that we played against that I didn't like to mark. You know, there's a girl from Norway called Hager Reese who was unbelievable. Uh, and then the present player, I mean, Abby Wambach, she's, you know, the most goals in the world right now, where, which I, I can't just pick. I'm gonna say everybody, because someone's like, well, you didn't pick me. Um, <laughs> but the players that I, I got a chance to play with, I was inspired by, from Abby to Megan Rapino to Alex. I got six months out and I overlapped in there. 
Uh, so to see these players now be the veterans on the team and be leaders and all that is pretty incredible. Yeah. You have one back, one back there and we'll get you guys. Did you ever play any other sports in your childhood? Yes, I love that question. Yes, everything. When I made the national, it was junior right in high school. When I made the U.S. team in junior high school, I was still playing basketball and softball. My junior year and my senior year. And I think I went in late to a, so a national team camp because I had a softball game. What? <laughs> you don't hear about that, right? There's no way. And I, I love that question because I think it's so important to do other sports. I really do. It helps you. I, when I'm coaching and I'm talking to the soccer players, and I'm like, okay, how many of you guys play basketball? No one raises their hand. I'm like, oh my gosh, how do I even talk about shuffling? You know, basketball teaches that. Baseball, catching a fly ball, timing of a header coming down. All these elements in these other sports help you to be better. So if you like other sports and you're doing them, try to do it as much as you can, as long as you can. I know there are a lot of people that are saying, they're like, well, you gotta pick soccer or basketball. I don't, I don't agree with that or believe in that. I think other sports do help you. And plus, you know what? You meet new friends doing other sports. And that's what's cool too. Okay, this is our last question. Um, do your kids play soccer? <laughs> My, uh, my girls do. My, I have a daughter who's 11, Sydney, and my daughter Jordan is uh, 8, so they're 11, 8, and they do. And I did tell them that I said, you know, you guys, you don't have to play soccer. Dad and I are fine with you. And they're like, no, Mommy, we're good. And then I was just at my daughter's parent information night, and the last question on our sheet was, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm getting choked up. I have just saw this last night. She goes, I want to be a famous soccer player. And I, and I think that's it's great. But not because of me. You know why? Megan Rapinoe, Alex Morgan. <laughs> that's what she's got on her wall now. And that, for me, is so awesome because I was there. For the generation before you, they looked up to our team. Now my girls are looking up to these players, and I'm looking and I'm thinking, the impact these players are having on our kids is amazing. And it's so good to have a, a good example. And I think back to when I was playing and I was signing autographs, and sometimes when you sign autographs, you either lost or you're like, oh, this is the last thing I want to do. But it's the one thing that I can do that will last, have a lasting impression on someone. And I think when I look now at these players doing that, and when you guys, if you, anyone got the opportunity to meet any of the national team players ever? Did you did? You met Jill Ellis, the coach. That was cool, right? Yeah. So these, these things last for you, and, I, and I'm grateful that my daughters have them to look up to and, and want to emulate. And I told my kids, you can do anything you want, you just got to study first. <laughs> Some of you guys can guess probably their athletic ability might be a little bit better than their academic right now. But we're working hard. We're working hard. Um, but I think, are we wrapping it up? Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Uh, Christine, thank you yeah. so much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Really incredibly special. But Christine is going to sign books and maybe even a few soccer balls. I don't know. I yes. see some around. Mm. Um, so we are going to have her sitting at this table um, on a chair and water. And <laughs> we're going to have people line up this way yep. and around. So if you guys want to make yourself, it's a uh, book sale still going on. <laughs>